Come join us as we dive into the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, and learn with us how we can follow the call of our great shepherd, Jesus Christ. But you know, when you hear this passage that we have today, what does it make you think here in something like uh, what Jesus has talked about today? I think about it. What, what he just proclaimed about anger, about divisiveness, about disunity, what does that make you think when you actually hear that? Because when I read that passage, that actually stirs up a little a defensiveness inside of me when I hear what he's saying. Because I like to say, ah, no, I don't, I don't have anger like that, or maybe even Jesus. Come on. Anger's not a sin. And yet, he is talking about anger and it being a sin this morning. It reminds me a little bit of the story of Jesus and the young man. This is told a few places in the gospel. There was a rich young man who came to see Jesus. And he went to Jesus and he said, good teacher, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus gave the good Jewish answer. He said, well, keep the commandments. But the rich young man wasn't done yet. And so he asked Jesus, well, what commandments do I need to, te- do I need to keep, Jesus? And Jesus responded, well, you know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. You know, don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor. And the young man looked at him and said, I have done all of these. What else do I lack? And Jesus looked at him. And I like in Mark, it says he looked on him in, a, a, in love. It almost feels a little bit like pity because he knows where this is going to go. And Jesus says to him, one thing you lack, sell all you have and then come follow me. That young man had completed the commandments as far as he knew, but it went deeper than that. There was more beyond it than that. And when that young, rich man heard what Jesus had to say, he walked away because he couldn't do it. Now, when I hear what Jesus says in this text today, I think like that young man, and we hear a hard thing like that, our response sometimes can be to simply walk away from it. Walk away from it rather than wrestling with what God is saying. Because what Jesus is doing in this text today is he's revealing the differences between the human heart and the state of the kingdom. What is expected in the kingdom? Because he is preparing us for the kingdom of his Father and for the work that we will do. We're often, like that young rich man, we get stuck trying to do the minimum effort to get in the door, and Jesus is trying to push us on through into the kingdom. Now, the issue he's dealing with today, as far as I see it, is the issue of disunity and our inability to forgive. I think that's at the heart of what Jesus is addressing as he deals with anger here this morning. And I think we could probably all say, if not at this very moment, though I wouldn't be surprised, at least sometime in our life, we have dealt with the inability to forgive, or perhaps sowing disunity. I think we can all say we struggle with that. So we're going to look and see what Jesus says about that this morning as we look in this passage. So if your Bibles aren't open there yet, please go ahead and open there with me. Matthew chapter 5, looking at verses 21 through 26, what Aaron just read for us. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. And it's here, as we get to this part of the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus begins giving these commands. He begins giving His commandments. Now last week we covered the reality that Jesus is beginning to challenge their long-standing notions of what the law is, their long-standing traditions. He's beginning to challenge them for the people. Jesus, as the lawgiver himself, is moving them beyond just the law into what the ethics of the kingdom actually look like. Or in other words, how are we to be kingdom people in the kingdom of God? And so as we see here, as Jesus teaches this, He gives us these three images of disunity that we're going to look at. That's anger and its reward, leaving your gift and making it right. We're going to look at those three images as Jesus laid them out, and we're going to look at what kingdom living looks like this morning. So let's jump in and take a look here. It begins with these three images. They're they're almost like parables. They're not quite parables, though at the end they, they certainly reach that level. But he's using these in order to make them think a little differently about how the kingdom works. Because he's moving beyond just the letter of the law, which is, in this case, do not murder. Well, well we know what that means, sure. But how's it, how does that apply to a person who finds himself in the kingdom of God? 
how does that apply to someone who says, I'm following Jesus, not just trying to get the law done? Now, as we jump into this, I will say this. It, it, it can help you as we ask these questions. If you can envision in your mind somebody right now that you might have a problem with. I, again, I, I can do that. I think you could probably do that. Think of somebody who you have a problem with, somebody you haven't forgiven, somebody who you might be angry with, or somebody who is angry with you. You know there is a division. If we think about a specific person right now, we will be able to think about the application here. And I even put a little spot on those notes there for today where you can even write a name in for that person so you can think about that. The only warning I will give you is if you're sitting next to that person, maybe use some code words or something. That might not be as easy if they peek over. But get a person in your mind like that so that we can think about this as Jesus addresses this issue. Well, he begins here with this one. First part, he says, but I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Okay, I think that's a shocker for the people as they're hearing this. Remember, Jesus has the crowd all around him as he's preaching this sermon. And he says, you've heard it said, yeah, if, if, if you murder, you're going to be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with a brother, then you will be liable to judgment. And you see here, Jesus is just switching the words. He uses all the same words except he replaces angry with a brother instead of murder, which means to be angry with a brother is to have the same level of judgment upon you. And when he says brother here, I'm sorry for those of you without brothers or those of you who are fine with your brothers, it's not meaning a brother relationship. Uh, it's not even really meaning the religious significance of brother. This is the nationalistic sense of brother, which really applies to everyone. So we can't really get around it to say, I can be angry with those people. No, no, th this counts for everybody, whoever you might be angry with. So that's what we hear. If you are angry with your brother, then that is equivalent to committing murder. So the question we must ask is, do we believe Jesus? Or I guess for you, do you believe Jesus and what he's saying here? This is pretty harsh. This is pretty strong stuff. I think we'd have two reactions to this. Two reactions when we hear something that this, is this hard to take. It's an eternal re internal reaction or an external reaction. Do we take Jesus at his word? Or do we try and do all the grammar gymnastics we can to try and prove how, well, he doesn't mean what he says here. You know, it, it's not really what he, he, this isn't the implication of what he's saying. In other words, we, we try and take a look at the text and what we read, and we take our condition, and we try and take our condition and put it into the text. Change it up a little bit so it fits us a little bit easier. He can't be talking about just being angry with my brother. I have somebody I'm angry with, and that's not a sin. Well, unfortunately, when we do that, there's actually a fancy term. If you really want a good fancy term, it's called eisegesis. That's a good one. You can use that around the dinner table. Eisegesis means to read into the text what you are looking for. And we can do that with this text here. <laughs> oh, what does anger mean? Well, maybe I'll change the definition. Yeah, what we should do, the opposite of that, is a word called exegesis. Another great word you can use at the dinner table. It means to pull it out of the text what the meaning is here. And what we see is wow, this is some hard stuff. This is a sin for us to be angry like this. And so the difference in how we deal with the text then is either we look at it and say, well, Jesus can't mean what it, I think what he seems to mean, so it has to mean something that's a lot easier for me, or it drives us to our knees begging forgiveness of God and asking, God, are we really murderers at heart? And we might just hear from him, yeah, at times you are, and we really do need that forgiveness. But he goes on. That's just where he begins, because if we continue seeing in this one example here, he goes on to say that whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Like that, he's getting a little, you know, fire and brimstone going there for them just on account of anger. And of course, things that we wouldn't even think are all that important or all that serious. He says, what does anger get us? The same judgment as murder. What does murder get us? Well, in the Old Testament, it got you death. And spiritually, it gives you hell. So that gives us hell and death. That's what judgment is. But then he says, if you insult someone, you'll be liable to the judgment of the council. Now, when he says insult here, the word in some Bibles, you actually just read the word raka. And raka means empty-headed. 
So, idiot, you know, idiot. pretty much that's what, if you, if you call your brother an idiot, you're going to be guilty for the judgment, or liable to the judgment of the council, which only takes it up a notch a little bit. Like, how can you get more than death and hell? Okay, well, death and hell and more judgment. But he goes on. It's not just Raka. He also says that anyone who calls his brother a fool, and when it comes to fool, where Raka is insulting their intelligence, being a fool insults their moral integrity. Because in Scripture, a fool is one who doesn't follow the way of God. Wisdom is to follow the way of God. Being a fool is to not follow the way of God. Either way, and if you call him a fool, what are you liable to? As he says, the, fire, the hell of fire, or the Gehenna of fire that we see here, the place of judgment, you will be liable to that. So no matter which way you go, when it comes to this anger here, it's death, it's hell, and even fire thrown in for good measure. And that's what we see. To which we respond, but anger is not a sin, right? Can we think of any passages that might say that anger is not a sin? Well, yeah, we go to something like Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Well, what we want here is something called a biblical theology. That is an understanding of God that takes into account all of Scripture. And we have to ask ourselves in Ephesians, what is Paul talking about when he talks about the anger there? Jesus seems pretty clear what he's talking about. In Ephesians, when he, Paul's talking about being angry and not sinning, that's a real hard sell for us. How are we to be angry without sin? Well, certainly we can be angry without acting out on it, but remember, sin is missing God's mark. Meaning, for us to be angry righteously, we'd have to be angry at those things that make Jesus angry. So as long as we're there, it seems like maybe we're good. But man, this is a hard, hard saying. So maybe according to Paul, anger itself is not a sin, but allowing anger to thrive, or even saying simple insults against another is against the kingdom, and that is sin. What I think Jesus is doing here is truly unveiling the heart of the law. The law keeps it simple. It says don't murder. That is restraining evil for the peace of mankind so that we can at least survive on this world. But the heart of what Jesus is getting at here is beyond that. Because murder really is the end result of disunity. When you get to the end result of disunity, when you can't be with another person, it goes beyond all else, well, it leads to murder. Either because you can't live in a world with them or you care so little about them, there is absolutely no unity there. So the law steps in and brings peace but not unity, but in the kingdom we are called to be united. And that heart, in the heart of that, no disunity should be allowed. Now, yeah, again, that seems like a tall order, but remember what Jesus prayed for us. Remember on that night when he was betrayed, he was up there praying for his disciples, and then he stopped and prayed for you. In John 17, 20 through 23, I actually have this up here for us to see, where Jesus says this. This is a prayer to his Father. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love me, even as you have loved me. That is Jesus' prayer for us, that we would be one, united. And the goal of that is so that the world would know. So, think of that name that you have in your mind or have you written down. Think about that one. Have you caused disunity on account of your anger? Well, maybe you're guilty of sin in that relationship. This is where you can be thankful for Jesus. Because the truth is, no matter where we are, you're all guilty of death and hell, of sin, and therefore gain death and hell because of that and we have no hope except through jesus christ because we do need to remember this as we look at all of these that god the father looked down on all of us and we were all fallen and astray we'd all turned against him sin and fallen away from his glory yet he loved us so much that god the father sent his son jesus christ to earth in order to live that perfect life according to the law perfectly living that out and as an example for us all the things we were supposed to do and then he went to that cross, taking our sin and our judgment upon him, dying for that, that we may have life. And then he rose again three days later to proclaim victory and to give us the freedom 
that we can actually walk in Him and follow after Him in His example and have eternal life with Him. If you trust Him and believe in this, then you have the ability to walk in His life and actually live in love here. And the moral of this story here is that in Christ, you can take your anger to God because of the work Jesus Christ did, rather than taking it out on your brother. We don't want to cause disunity. So that's the first one, disunity. But Jesus quickly moves on to the next application. What if somebody could be angry about you? Verse 23 and 24, we read this here. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. What a circumstance here. He's really hitting them where they are. They all want to be good worshipers of God, so the first thing that they would do or want to do is go to the temple, bring their offering here. And so Jesus places us in almost a first-person perspective of when you go to the temple to worship, you have your offering to give, and as you're there, you're ready to present it, and you remember, wait, my brother has something against me. I can't do this now. And they place the offering down, and you go out and make it right. Now for us, you know, the example for us would be definitely the church, and we come together to worship. That we would come here and realize, oh, I have something wrong. I need to make it right now. That is the most important thing. Now sometimes, the truth is, we get caught up so much in life and our busyness or our traditions that we simply don't make time to make things right. If at any time, you shouldn't let anything interfere it really should be your time of worship with the Lord, which I find a little funny because it does seem at times, really, that we'll let almost anything interfere with our worship of God. You know, I can't come in today. Now, don't come in if you're sick. Please stay home if you're sick. But, you know, I can't come in because I'm tired or I'm running late or I have a game or I want to watch a game. Those all come first. I'll worship later, but I know you won't because I understand. I've done the same thing. And yet... We will let almost anything, including worship, interfere with making things right with somebody. I will let anything come between having to make that phone call to say I'm sorry, or making that phone call to say I forgive you, or knocking on that door to meet with somebody you haven't seen. We'll allow almost anything to get in the way of that. But Jesus is saying here, don't let anything interfere. If disunity shows up, take care of it. If you need to forgive someone, Go and forgive them. Don't even let your ceremony stand against it. So what do you do then? You reconcile with them. Now that word reconcile here, that's a really interesting word. That that particular word only shows up one time in all the New Testament. It is a very particular view of how to reconcile. And the ideal that's coming out in this word is that there is a gap between two others. Two separate people. And yet somehow a bridge is built across them. There there is something that is cut between and through them in order to bring them together. Something bridges the gap. I'm going to tell you, if that's the work of reconciliation, that indicates that it will take work. It will take effort. We can praise God that we can do this in Christ, but it will not necessarily be easy. So again, look at that name. All right, Have you worked on reconciliation with that person? Have you done the work of reconciliation? with the person that you might have written down or that you're thinking about, because that's what we're called to. And notice Jesus doesn't say, wait until you have it all together. Wait till you figure it all out. He says, don't let anything interfere. Like many of the things Jesus is going to say in this sermon, I'll tell you what, as a counselor, I would never want it to counsel this way, but perhaps our problem is that we simply don't listen to Jesus as he's called us to do. Perhaps we haven't just stepped out in faith and trusted him, with what he's actually calling us in the case of reconciliation, forgiveness, and the rest. But we have a final story here that really drives home the need to make things right. The last one here, picking up in verse 25. It says here, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you paid the last penny. Now, I'll be honest, that text, I've read that for years throughout my Christian life and thought that actually applied directly to lawsuits and legalities. I sort of missed the point of what was going on here. I thought it dealt with how do you handle a dispute, but that's not actually what's going on in this story. This is a parable here, 
And the accuser in this case is one who has something against you. The accuser in this case is one you haven't forgiven yet. Now, it might be because of that translation of that term there, come to terms quickly. Because the idea of come to terms sounds so businesslike. But in reality, that word means literally make good feelings towards the other person. Or if we were to say in more normal English, make friends with that person. That is the concept going on there. Now, that's not nearly as easy to come to terms. Come to terms can be businesslike. Okay, we can agree to disagree. But this says to make good feelings or make friends with them. So this person... This person is not dragging you to the actual court. He's dragging you to the judgment of God because of unforgiveness, because of inability to deal with disunity. And you're not going to get out of that until you pay your due. And there's really some warning here. Jesus gives some warning here because if you persist in not making things right, if you persist in not, in this case, making friends, you're headed to a prison of your own making. And you're not going to get out until you pay the price. Well, can you make friends with that person? Of course not. You're angry with them. You have a problem with them. But Jesus did. We've got to remember that in all of these. Jesus is our example. And what did Jesus do? Well, he made friends. Now, of course, when we talk about what Jesus did, I often think, Oh, what it would have been like to be his brother, right, James? Imagine that. That'd be wonderful having Jesus as your brother, right? No way, because Mary would constantly be coming and say to you, why can't you be more like your brother Jesus? To which the only proper response is, but he's Jesus, you know? But for us, we are called to follow in Jesus' example. But he's Jesus. Yes, but he lives in you. And his example is this, that he's shown us in John 15, 15. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Think about that. I think the distance between you and God is a little greater than the distance between you and anyone you're angry with, anyone you have a problem with, anyone you withheld forgiveness from. And yet God, Jesus was able to make you his friend. In his power, you can do the same. He's our model. And if Jesus can make friends with you, what could he do through you? So the moral of that story, make it right and make friends. So that's three examples. Three examples of what our, our kingdom expectations are. So how does this live out? Well, we remember Jesus is the lawgiver. He outlines the kingdom to us. He tells us what it looks like and what we are to do. So what should we do? We should follow him. He is the only way we can do this, but in him we can. We can make things right. We can bring unity. We can see wounds healed. And again, Jesus ultimately is our example because he went to the cross to make things right. He paid the penalty that we are dragged to court for. And if he can do that, Again, what might he do through you to bring reconciliation? On, on the topic of reconciliation, I remember this story. This is, um, this is not dealing with anger or disunity because of uh, a problem in relationship directly. It's more involving family circumstances. It's actually Chantel's story, but it's, it's one of those areas of reconciliation that I was just amazed by. Many of you know this story, but Chantel... Chantel's family, she comes from a somewhat of a broken family, and for a time, she essentially raised her younger brothers, Jeffrey, Cameron, and Robbie, and they were separated when those kids were only like four and five or five or six, and they were told that she was dead, and they moved her across the country to live with her mother, and there was no connection between them for 20-some years, and every year, Chantel would, would actually, on their birthday... I would know it was coming. She would so show the signs, and she would get really sad on her their birthday because she cared for them like a mother when they were little. And she would have her, she would make them a cake. She would think about them. We'd pray for them and all that. And in my mind, I thought there'd never be any connection between them. There could never be any restoration of relationship there. We don't even know where they are. We don't know where they lived. We don't know what names they were going by. We, we knew nothing until one day, it wasn't even all that long ago, less, about a little less than 10 years ago, she got a message while we were in Vermont. One of their mentors had found us because of the ministry we were working at in Vermont and saw that Chantel was a stable person, saw that she was involved with Christian ministry, and decided to reach out and make that connection. 
And for the first time in 20-some years, Chantel was able to have a phone conversation with her brother, Cameron. And just a couple years later, Cameron stayed and actually lived with us for a while and lived out in uh, Dallas for a while. And just as we were out in Dallas, she had almost all, all but one of her brothers together as they were hanging out, as we hung out in Ohio with them. And I looked at that, and I see that as such an image of reconciliation. There are things that we didn't think we could get over, uh, problems we didn't think that we could surmount, and yet God handled them all. And the same can be true in your relationship. If you have somebody you need to reconcile with, it won't be the same circumstance. And it might be anger, it might be problems, issues, disagreements, rather than distance and time. And yet God can bridge those gaps for you if you trust Him and take a step out in faith and actually work towards reconciliation. He will do that. But you might need to be the one who has to make the sacrifice. Again, this is never advice I would give as a counselor, but this is what Jesus teaches. Because I want to say protect yourself, you know, keep, keep up the walls, be safe. But I'm going to tell you here, don't sell Jesus short on what he can do. He made it right. So let things be made right. Maybe the only thing standing between you and forgiveness is actually yourself. And God's ready to do that work in you. I say, as myself, in my response, my flesh response is, I have a right to be angry and hold this against that person. To which Jesus responds, so did I, but I still died for you. And we get to live that out. He gives us that ability. So I gave you another place to write something there. If you want to, it's free for you to write because we often have problems. You can write down, I say I have this problem with this person, but what does Jesus truly say? Then act on it. Give up disunity, put away anger, make things right, forgive, and make friends. This is practice for us, getting us ready for the kingdom of God because this is supposed to be the way of the life in the kingdom. Now, again, not advice that I'd happily give, but it's not my advice. It's Jesus' commandments, and it's Jesus' command to you as well. So heed it well. Let us pray. Lord God, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your word and the challenge that it can be. I think of those in my life who I need to forgive, those in my life that I need to make things right with, Lord, I pray I wouldn't just set them down and let my busyness take over again, but I pray that I would walk in faith and seek the unity that you have for me. And I pray that for each and every one of these gathered here, Lord. We have broken relationships in our life. We have problems that have been caused by others or have been caused by us. Lord, I pray that you would show us the clear path forward toward unity, toward healing, toward reconciliation. All that you might get the glory that others would see our love and know it's not us, know that it could not be us doing it, that there must be a greater power, that this might point towards you, that you may be honored and glorified, and that the life of your Son, Jesus, would be seen as active and present in us. Lord, may we submit to this, and may we go out from here following the command of your Son. And these things we lift up, we pray, in the name of our Savior and our Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.